chill. Hello everyone, I can ask the talk. The nice times with us, we are very glad to have all of you here. Can I world and the universe? Actually, I can ask the talk we became one part of the PKU's Global Open Talks. You know, PKU's Global Open Talks, named as X License, was started this Wednesday. Uh, they invited many top scientists and speakers to talk about different topics. So yeah, for this new series, please be sure you know to uh, follow at PKU's you know online talks. And every Wednesday, that's eight o'clock. So this was uh, a series talks was co-linked with I can X talks. Uh, that will cover much more topics than not just science. So. Uh, and uh, we know that this week was special for IKX Talks because this week we have ACS Nano Rising Star in Nanoscience and uh, Nanotechnology. How this going on? How to get all these uh, IKX Talks? Now we have uh, Professor Paul Weiss, who is the chief editor of ACS Nano, and he is also the founder of this journal. He has uh, stories to tell. Paul. Yeah, is the stage is yours, please. Thank you so much, Alice. I don't Good. know if I'm up yeah. there yet. Um, well, I'll, I'll uh, just go ahead and talk. Uh, yeah. We're delighted yes. to join with you from the start of the ICANX lectures. And one of the things that we normally do in the world is uh, go to conferences, uh, visit universities and research institutes around the world, and we're able to ask our hosts and our friends to help us identify uh, the up and coming researchers at those places. In this time when our travel is restricted, we've been looking for another way to find the, the groups that are the future of nanoscience and nanotechnology. So it's been wonderful to join with you and with our editors to help, help find the people who can uh, lay out what's to come, uh, to highlight their work and to introduce them to the world in a way that they also are not getting the opportunity to do uh, because travel uh, is, is so restricted. So this is the first round of Rising Star uh, lectures. And today uh, we'll have uh, Miso Kim from the Korea Research Institute of uh, Structure and Science. Uh, we'll have Nanshu Liu from University of Texas at Austin and Wei Gao from Caltech. In addition to the lectures that they give, We'll ask them to write perspectives on where they see nanoscience and nanotechnology going in their fields. And we'll also ask for their continuing advice uh, in an advisory board of rising stars. And so we're really delighted to have them on board at ACS Nano uh, to uh, work together with you. And you see editor Yuri Gagotzi here and our other editors around the world uh, in helping identify these rising stars. And we're really looking forward uh, to these lectures and the enormous global platform that you've been able to put together for us. And so uh, I think what I'll do now is turn it over to Yuri uh, to introduce our first rising star. This is Yuri Gagatsi, uh, a world famous material scientist, leader and pioneer uh, at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Pennsylvania on the east coast of the United States. I think I've been muted, sorry. Uh, good morning uh, to everyone in America. Uh, good evening to everyone in Asia and uh, good day uh, to uh, our European African Middle East colleagues. It is my pleasure to introduce the first uh, ACS Nano Rising Star Lecturer, Dr. Uh, Mizo Kim from Korea Research Institute of Standards and Science. You might have uh, listened to a talk by Professor Zhong Lin Wang about energy harvesting in the very beginning of this lecture series of I Can X. Uh, talks. And 
with this presentation from uh, Dr. Uh, Ms. Kim, uh, we kind of continue the topic of harvesting energy. And Mizo uh, is a senior research scientist at Korea Research Institute of Standards uh, and Science, Chris. But she received her uh, undergraduate degree in material science and engineering from Seoul National University, a top institution in South Korea. And she continued toward master's and PhD uh, degrees in material science and engineering again, uh, studying at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, famous MIT on the East Coast of the United States. After graduation, she joined Chris as a senior research scientist in 2012. And she has been pursuing research on analytical modeling, design, experimental characterization of piezoelectric material, smart structures, including metamaterials for energy harvesting, as well as sensing applications. She is a young rising star, but she has already uh, led major research projects in Korea. And with this, I give the word to Dr. Kim, who will tell you about your exciting research. Welcome to the talk. Thank you so much, Yuri, for introducing me very nicely. Um, I um, share my screen first. Okay, I think I can see myself on top of the podium and with my slides, okay. Okay, I'm going to talk today, uh, I'm Miso Kim, um, Smile Kim, uh, you can see the Chinese character of my name as well. And I work at Chris right now, I talk about, I introduce Chris a little bit later. So today, as you introduced already, I'm going to talk about the metamaterial based energy harvesting, energy focusing, energy harvesting. So energy harvesting is the research topic that Professor Zhong Min Wang already addressed very nicely. He's the founder of the energy generator, and he's the big guy in energy harvesting. And about the metamaterials, you've already heard of the uh, uh, optical metamaterials from Professor um, Nicholas Fang at MIT uh, in this series of talks as well. But at the end of his talk, he talked about the acoustic matter materials to uh, cancel the noise um, a little bit um, for about 10 minutes. So you can go back to their um, movies again um, after my talk if you're interested. So I'm going to talk about technology where we can merge these two interesting, two attractive, these two um, technology matter materials and energy harvesting are merged together. And before I go on, I'd like to introduce the National Institute where I work, the Korea Research Institute of Standards and Science. So for those who are not, who may not be familiar with the here, Chris, um, Chris is the Korean version of National Meteorology Institute. So like NIST in the United States, and I searched it, and I and I am uh, in China, National Institute of Meteorology. So um, here, this is the main gate I pass by every day. And we are located in the, um, okay, we are located in the center of the South Korea. So if you are familiar with Seoul, the capital here, and I'm now here and talking to speaking to you. So I think I, uh, this is the best way to start with my lecture, uh, with my talk, uh, with this picture um, for two reasons. First, this is where I met Alice. That's why I was, I'm so fortunate to be selected as the first speaker of this uh, writing, ACS Nano Writing Star today. And I met her here. And the other reason is that energy harvesting is the one, the very topic, the research topic that connect us at this conference. And here we uh, gave a talk to, together and got to know each other. So energy harvesting is my beloved research topic, but we start uh, with, uh, we need to, I, I wanna talk about why we need this energy harvesting technology first. So, um, 
So as far as I know, a lot of cities launched those uh, very nice programs for smart cities and everybody's pursuing like smart cities. Everything is connected, smart life and everything. So the key word here is the uh, getting connected uh, and then everything is connected. So connectedness. In order to connect everything, what we need is the internet of things so that we can connect everything. Um, it, the essential part of the internet of things are sensors. So we need to uh, detect something from our own body or from animals or from our routines or like industrial sites or signals from the environment so that we can connect, we can send some signals and get connected. But the problem is we uh, use power sources for these IoT sensors uh, with batteries. Batteries are very nice and great, but the, if you use batteries uh, in certain places inaccessible, we need to replace them with high cost and with high danger too. So if we can um, self, uh, you can use some self powering system like energy harvesting for IoT sensors, then it will solve some problem and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, necessities are, are out there for energy harvesting for this reason. So energy harvesting is a technology that, um, that can convert ambient energies existing in nature in our daily life and in, in industrial sites, otherwise wasted into electrical energy. Right now I'm talking to you and I'm making some sounds, the sound is going away. Uh, of course, I'm conveying some messages, but it's going away. So it's not converted into electrical energy, but if I use them into uh, into uh, if I use them to convert them into electrical energy, that's an energy sound energy harvesting technology. So uh, you are looking at the uh, the bar here, and then it's um, representing the potential power levels that each uh, energy harvesting sources or these different energy harvesting sources can generate. So I, I'd like to make a. I'd like to make point out that um, so there are so many kinds of energy harvesting technology depending on the sources, and then these energy harvesting technologies are not competitive in, with each other. So instead, depending on the target applications, what we can do is we can choose energy harvesting sources. If you need a megawatt like a power level, then you can choose wind energy harvesting. But here, uh, what I chose is mechanical energy harvesting because that can generate like very small power ranging from milliwatt to microwatt levels. And that's what we need for powering IoT uh, wireless sensor networks. It's a very attractive technology, the mechanical energy harvesting, and I've worked on it like for, I guess, 15, more than 15 years now, but still we have so many issues. It, it's a pity, but at the same time, it's a lot for me because I have a lot of work to do from now on for a while. So the uh, first thing uh, we need to solve is performance. Since uh, we, although we've experienced a lot of enhancement in power performance uh, from energy harvesting for the past decades, still we need to increase more voltage and more power. And the, the significant problem lies on the current level. So we need to increase the current level to out of the mechanical energy harvesting. In terms of the mechanical performance, we have to think about the uh, reduction in resonant frequencies. The uh, vibrations or those mechanical waves, the characteristics are like this. So um, what we make from vibrations has a very low frequency levels. But the thing is, if you want, and at the same time, we want to use a very small sizes of devices. Intrinsically, small size devices have a very high frequencies, but at resonances, they can, uh, they can generate the maximum power. So if we want to match the resonant frequencies between, if we want to align the resonant frequencies between the nature and the, the natural sound, energy harvesting sources with our devices, we need to find a way to reduce the resonant frequencies and what which I did a little bit uh, with uh, adding the mass. And we want to operate these energy harvesting devices in a wide range of frequencies. But as I said before, at, at resonances, the power is maximized. And that means uh, and at off resonances, we have very reduced power generation. So that's why we need some more broadband uh, energy harvesting designs for broadband operations. And unlike solar cells or thermoelectric generators, we don't have a really a standardized that we, uh, we um, 
that together all over the world as a figure of merit for vibration energy harvesting or the mechanical energy harvesting yet. So we need to work on the standardization problem as well. So once we um, achieve a certain level of performance, the next thing we have to think about or, uh, think about is reliability. Since we are focusing, we are using the moving structures um, uh, to generate the energy out of mechanical energy harvesting, the first fatigue uh, comes can come from structure fatigue. And the other thing is we are using piezoelectric or triboelectric uh, functional materials. So we have to think about the piezoelectric degradation. At the same time, we have to think about the using a selection of lead free materials. The reason is that um, the most high performance, um, the highest performance piezoelectric materials are based on lead. Uh, so, and uh, people have de tried to be develop the lead free materials, uh, which have equivalent or enhanced the properties more than uh, lead based materials, but it's still challenging. So these are the issues, but today I'm going to focus more, um, mostly the uh, performance of the mechanical energy harvesting. In order to increase, enhance the energy harvesting performance in terms of power, we have to look at the, uh, the energy um, flow mechanisms like here. So if there's a vibrations, we want to make the vibrations of being absorbed as much as possible into the devices first. That's the first step here. And the first step is in, uh, it involves the um, optimizing of device designs like here. So in terms of geometry, you can make a circular one, you can make a triangular one to make the efficient um, absorption from mechanical to mechanical. Once we have a structure and the, and the device has the mechanical energy inside, then it needs to be converted into electrical energy. So for that, what we need is high efficient materials, piezoelectric materials or the electric materials that can support or structural layers that can support the piezoelectric materials for high efficiency conversion. And once we generate the electrical energy out of the conversion mechanism, conversion devices, then we lose a lot uh, across the power management circuit. For that, we need a really a customized uh, energy harvesting circuit designs like here. And at the end, what we have as a target application like sensors, if we can have a low, low power electronics, then we can mix at certain point. We have a small power generation and they need only a small power. Then we can have practical applications like here. So uh, there are three approaches in three categories for energy harvesting power performance enhancement. So in terms of this re these regards, what I did uh, for the first time as energy harvesting researcher was the development of analytical model that can predict the performance of the energy harvesting performance, uh, performance uh, voltage and power of the vibration-based piezoelectric energy harvester. So we developed the analytical model very accurately. And what, what uh, the model can do is that we can predict where the power, can, where it, uh, is the position the power can be maximized. So if power can be maximized at resonances, but the important message here is that it can shift. So uh, when you connect the energy harvesting devices to the electrical circuits or the, your target application, there's an electrical impedance connected. Then the electrical impedance uh, influences the, uh, the position where your, your resonance occurs. And that, that means you can uh, you have to um, tune the, your device. Uh, you have to design the device again according to the resonance point. So that's what the uh, predictive model can do. So we experimentally verify, and we uh, so that we can confirm the predictive capability of these models we, de we developed. So we extended our work to see the output harvesting performance depending on the selection of electrode configuration. For example, even if we use the same piezoelectric material like here, if we use the capacitor type electrode like here, or if, in depending on the selection of uh, electrode configuration like capacitor type or interdigitated type, even with the piezo, same piezoelectric layer and same structure layer, it can yield different uh, levels of performances. That's what we've studied. And the other thing we can do is I've mentioned a little bit uh, already. Uh, we put masses at the end of the vibrating cantilevers or, or other structures to reduce down the intrinsic uh, resonance frequency of the energy harvesting devices. 
But depending on the size of the proof masses, the analytical model we have to use to predict the performance of energy harvesting system is different. That's what we uh, showed analytically and experimentally as well here. So um, we looked at the, uh, the environmental condition as well. So um, the nature has a very uh, random vibration characteristics. Even in the random vibration signals, we can categorize into three, uh, three uh, kinds like here. So the first thing is, um, the amplitude, only amplitude changes with time. The next thing is frequency changes with time while amplitude is constant. Or the other uh, option is uh, we, uh, we can see those signals uh, where ampli both amplitude and frequency are modulated. That's why it's M. So or modulated with time. So the good example of the amplitude modulation vibration signal is the trend, the vibration of transformers you can see everywhere. And the other good example for the amplitude and frequency modulation uh, by random vibration signals, uh, you can find it from the vibration of the cars. So we mimic these vibrations from the uh, um, industrial or the, our daily life uh, to uh, make those random vibration signals and uh, develop the tool, the predictive tool to um, calculate the output harvesting performance under these non-stationary random vibration signals. So for that, we also, uh, we uh, again, uh, experimentally verified, and as you can see, those uh, experimental results and prediction results, the analytical modeling results are in great, great agreement, uh, luckily to us. And the other uh, aspect I'd like to emphasize here is that uh, the correlation, we introduced some statistical correlation metrics so that we can compare quantitatively the experimental results and experimental output performance with the um, uh, analytical output performance, both in terms of absolute magnitude and the trend. So if you look at those metrics, you can see how much percentage the trends are in agreement or in how much percentage the absolute uh, magnitudes are in great agreement. And that's what we did um, to look at the other uh, uh, vibration environment for energy harvesting. And also I'm working on, I've worked on the uh, um, uh, development of high performance piezo materials for energy harvesting. Um, so there was a low loss piezoelectric single crystal fibers that was used for, to, used for piezoelectric and magnetoelectric composite, as well as a composite uh, and harvesting as well. And right now I'm, I focused on the electron, um, I, I focused on the electro spinning technology to produce the piezoelectric nanofibers. And it's, on, it's just an uh, ongoing state. So I'm not focusing today here, but I'm, also working on the materials here. That's what I wanted to emphasize. So, so far I've uh, talked about the structure or materials aspect or the theoretical modeling of the energy harvesting itself, energy harvesting conversion or the management part. So those are the conventional things. So um, as you see in from the title, now it's time to talk about the meta materials uh, related energy harvesting. So you look at the uh, the mechanical waves. There are so many um, uh, so many kinds of mechanical sources. Depending on the input mechanical sources, it has different frequency levels. So these are all mechanical waves. I'm looking at these uh, levels of frequencies. And the conventional energy harvesting in energy harvesting systems, as I addressed so far. Uh, what we what we focused is the um, high efficient devices and materials for efficient energy conversion and high efficient circuits for power management. But what if we, we can amplify those input energies around like these mechanical waves into the desired point and then convert them and then manage them. And that's what we thought. And I think that there are a lot of people out there to, who thought the same way. So the analysis is like this. So if we have a, 
I think you've experienced this, uh, you had an experience like me, uh, like this thing. So you have a paper probably in, in your childhood and you cannot burn the paper just with the sunlight. But if you have a magnifying lenses, you can focus the sunlight into the spot you want and then you can burn them because the energy is focused. So what if we can have a magnifying lenses like that for mechanical energy harvesting? So matter materials are the magnifying lenses for us like this. So that's a new paradigm because we are focusing on amplification of input energy even before the energy conversion occurs. So this kind of, I, I want to call it a new paradigm, but I started to call them like a new paradigm a few years ago. So I'm not quite sure for now it can, it can be a new paradigm. But so I'd like to um, introduce the concept of metamaterials before I move to the metamaterials based energy harvesting. So when I came up, uh, when I saw the word metamaterials, I was curious because metamaterials are new material. They, people said it's a new materials, but they said we can make it out of conventional materials like aluminum. So I looked it up and I realized that meta means beyond. And material means not the materials, it's a material properties. So a meta materials are defined as the uh, artificially engineered structures that can exhibit some unique properties that unconventional properties that we cannot see in nature uh, easily. So it's just, uh, it's, it's, we can make meta materials out of the conventional materials, but it's more of a structures and dynamically within some specific ranges, you can observe some negative or even zero mass density or modulus. If I can have a negative mass density, that would be really ideal for me to, when I weigh myself. And this say, these are the meta, if it has, uh, it can exhibit these uh, material properties, unconventional material properties, in broader meaning, we call all of these structures metamaterials. So I, uh, um, to give you some um, feeling about the metamaterials in mechanical wave ranges, I put this slide here. So uh, Professor Nicole Fang talked about the optical ranges. So it's closely related to nanophotonics because the frequency is like this high and the wavelength is related to unicell of these uh, wave, uh, wave these matter materials. That's why it's closely related to nanophotonics. But in ultrasound or in a post waves, even in the bigger seismic waves, we look at the, the scale, we look at is centimeters or millimeter scales because the frequency is about these 70 kilohertz or seven to nine kilohertz, even below one kilohertz. That means we have a much larger wavelength. That means we have a larger scale of uh, matter materials. Um, so this is the, uh, the uh, comparison of the uh, waves uh, depending on the sources. So in terms of the mechanical matter materials, uh, in a broader meaning, we call all of these like the matter materials, but um, sometimes we strictly uh, categorize them into several, uh, several uh, kinds. So the first, the representative two are demonstrated here. The first thing is phononic crystals, and the phononic crystals are periodic arrangement. So like similar to any periodic arrangement, it can have a band gap, uh, even though it has a different sizes. So once the waves propagate here, it cannot propagate further within the band gap within the certain range of frequencies like here. Or if you use it, so this is due to the Bragg scattering, but um, in this case, in acoustic or elastic matter materials, we use the concept of local resonances. I'm not going into detail here, um, but um, so today I'm going to focus mostly the phonon crystals, but we are working on the acoustic matter materials also based on local resonances. And the phenomenon we can observe out of the matter materials, not only the band gaps, the other thing is the negative refractive uh, re refractions. So the, the meaning here is that the band gap means energies go into the structures and they didn't go propagate further. That means energy is trapped inside the phonon crystals. That means we can use those trapped energies because they are highly dense by. And the other thing is, we, if we can control the direction of the refraction, not only the positive, in, like in conventional materials, if we can uh, control the direction into negative, then we can focus them into certain point. And that's why we can use these matter materials 
uh, using these wave uh, manipulation capabilities for energy harvesting. And other than energy harvesting, what we can look up is uh, the, uh, as applications of sound and vibration insulations and acoustic lenses, super lenses and hyper lenses, all those things. If you are really interested, there are so many nice review papers regarding these met acoustic meta materials. And um, one of our speakers for my Connect series, he was the author and I recommend this uh, paper a lot. And so, yeah. So from this point, at this, from this point, I'm going to talk about what we've done uh, for meta, uh, in terms of meta material based energy harvesting. So the first thing you can think of easily, the intuitively, uh, is the uh, energy localization inside the harmonic crystals. So energy is trapped inside the periodic arrangement and the harmonic crystals. And if we remove one unit cell, so create a, a defect. Defect is always unstable. So the unstable at unstable positions, the energy can be localized at the point. Then what we can do is we can locate the piezoelectric films or piezoelectric devices to harvest them. And that's what people did in the previous works like here. So vibration cases and sound cases and elastic waves, the solid waves in, in the plate. But the thing is here, uh, the absolute magnitude of the power generation the amplification ratio is very high, but the absolute magnitude power is not very high, like a nanowatt or microwatt. And the other thing is the cylinder type, the, uh, the hole type, the, all those things are very intuitive designs. So just uh, very simple designs. This is good, intuitive and very simple designs good. But we came up with this new designs, uh, which is Octangular type, whole octangular whole type unicell designs, so that we can maximize the band gap with a center frequency of 50 kilohertz here. So we uh, perform the size optimization, and then we got the parameters, and then with the center frequency, and we could broad, broaden the band gap size like here. And we calculated uh, of the designed super uh, only crystal super cells like here, and as you can see, we have a we have a band gap with a center frequency of 50. So if you look at here, we perform the harmonic analysis and you can see that once plane waves go through, uh, the supercell is here and at 40 kilohertz, which is outside the band gap and so we can call a propagation band, it goes further. But um, inside the band gap at 50 kilohertz, you can see that the wave propagation is prohibited. So energy is trapped. Then what? What we did next is we create a defect like here. So we didn't make the hole, and that's the defect inside here in, in, in this regard. So in the super cell, the defect is here, and we, when we perform the harmonic analysis, you can see clearly there's an energy localization and at the center with a maximum level. And if, if we calculate the other uh, band structure here, you can see that still band gap exists and defect band is created. So we can use the uh, this defect pen. And we fabricate using laser cutting. And this is the force, the octagonal force, and using two millimeter thick aluminum plate um, to make the phononic crystals. The reason why we chose aluminum plate, a lot of people who are working on um, elastic wave uh, research, wave uh, related research, we normally use aluminum plate. There's a reason. Um, the reason is, Aluminum plate is we we know uh, properties very uh, so we know uh, properties of the aluminum plate very well. So most of the properties are known. That's why we, once we make some certain different uh, some, some new uh, when we introduce new structures, then we can uh, differentiate the newly introduced phenomenon out of the uh, existing uh, material properties. That's why people use uh, aluminum when we try to experiment, evaluate those meta material performances. So um, before I go, um, so at the center, so this is a defect. So at the center, we attach the piezoelectric devices, which is commercially available. I'll talk about it a little later more. So this is our initial setup. So that was our first time to do the experiment with only crystals with elastic things. So the first thing we should do is they, we have to generate elastic waves. For that, we attach the piezoelectric to transducers here, and they can uh, generate elastic waves and propagate here. 
And um, in order to visualize the wave propagation uh, before the super, super cells and inside the super cell and the outside, behind the super cells, we use the uh, laser uh, Doppler vibrometers so that we can scan the whole uh, mechanical displacement. And lastly, and most importantly, we measure the energy harvesting performances using the simple circuit conditions. And I have to emphasize here that you might be surprised with um, this big size of our specimen. The reason why we, uh, we use this big size specimen is we want to make uh, the, uh, the environment like an infinite, um, infinite propagation of waves. So if we have a finite size of the uh, um, specimens, then it can induce reflected waves. So we, it's really hard to see uh, the pure behavior out of the metamaterials. That's why we use the infinite plate as much as possible. So from the experiment, like in simulations, what we can see is that before it, it does uh, signals go from this way, um, and when signals go this way, um, experimentally, we could visualize uh, the in-plane wave generations like here, beautifully. And inside the defect, you can see that there's a donut-like energy localization. So like, if you, if you can see myself, like this way, the Z directions, there's a pop, uh, so up and down motions. So uh, we attached the piezoelectric energy harvester later here. And behind the boronic uh, uh, crystals, you can see that there's little um, wave propagation, which means we have a band gap working. So a few of the waves are from reflected waves from the boundaries I um, already mentioned. So we looked at the energy harvesting performances and when compared with the uh, this, uh, energy harvesting devices without boronic crystals, it has an amplified voltage output like about, uh, about 4.8 times in terms of voltage and even in power, uh, uh, if, uh, power even more, so more than 22 times. And the, um, the most prominent part is that we, we got the uh, about milliwatt level of elastic wave energy harvesting. If you're familiar with like, um, tribal electric energy harvester or the vibration based energy harvesters, it's easy, not easy, but it's, it's, it, it, you can see easily about the milliwatt level of powers a bit, but in elastic waves, it's really rare. So it was, uh, as far as we know, it was the maximum level of power from elastic wave energy harvesting. And that was our kind of first work with metamaterials for energy harvesting. And in parallel, uh, we studied, we performed some parametric studies to see the effect of supercell size and the, def uh, and the defect location, the effect of defect locations. So uh, what we found here is that when we increase the supercell size, we expect that the degree of um, energy localization gets increased as well. But in the other ways, but um, unlike we thought, after the certain size of the supercell size, it just reaches the saturation level, so we don't have to increase the supercell size too much. And the other thing is, if you look at the defect location with the same size of the supercells, you can see that um, at the second part, it doesn't guarantee, because we only have one layer from, from the incident, it means that we don't have a periodicity yet. So that's why it, the energy is localized that much. But at third, uh, I, third position in the third column, you can see the energy is localized very well. But after that, it's because of the attenuation, the energy level is getting down again. So there's an optimum position for defect location as well. That's what we studied here. And also we are not only uh, limited to the uh, creation of a single defect, we studied the uh, interaction of double defects inside the supercells. So once we introduce two defects inside the supercells, if it's not too far from each other, they interact with each other. The result is that we have a defect band like here within a, using a single um, defect, like a six defect bands, but these six, each six defect bands are split into each other, so total 12. So this is a very interesting physics, and then you can see that, at the, uh, especially um, with an example of target defect band frequency about here, is split it into two like here. They show a monopole-like defect mode shape, but uh, at one frequency, 
59, about 59.7, they the mechanical displacement appear in phase while the other at the other frequency it shows out of phases. So we can use them uh, when we we can use them differently when we attach the piezoelectric devices on top of these two defects. So we can vary the types of electric uh, electrical circuits connected to each of piezoelectric devices. And depending on the type of the circuit connections, we can generate different levels of power out of these two defects using only crystals. So far I've talked about um, I've talked about the uh, energy localizing using only crystals. Now uh, from now I'll talk about the uh, uh, control of directivity of the wave of propagation. For that what we can do is we can vary the uh, we can vary the refractive index n which is closely related to, which is directly related to the wave propagation velocity. So if we vary n, that means we vary the velocity. That means we can bend the uh, waves depending on the position and depending on the n values toward the focusing point. So that's why we can use green lenses or green matter materials or green common clusters. So this is elastic energy harvesting. So we designed, um, we use the uh, genetic algorithm for optimization so that we can get the radius size of the holes so that we can design the whole elastic green lenses like here and we fabricate it using aluminum plate again. So, um, and we looked at the wave focusing capability first. If you look at the simulation, you can see that there's a focal point here and then there's a focal area uh, a little bit distributed. And um, considering the manufacturers, Manufacturing tolerance, uh, we rounded off the net values of the each uh, design parameter parameters, and we looked at it, uh, the performance, the focusing capability is still maintained. Experimentally, it's confirmed as well, and they are in great agreement. And since we have now focused energy at the focal point, what we did is we attached the piezoelectric device on top of the focal point, and we compare those energy harvesting capability with and without green structures. And um, there are point, two points I'd like to make here. Um, the first thing is with using green only crystals, what we can do is we can control not only the amplitude, but also the direction of the waves so that we can have a direction controllability. And the other thing is, unlike the phononic crystals, like this is our work here, but unlike the phononic crystals, in terms of power density, it has a very advantageous aspect. So when we divide the output power by the area, effective area, we have a really, really highest um, uh, power out power density. So, so, so far, I've talked about the elastic wave energy harvesting. Now I will talk about um, the sound uh, related focusing and sound focusing and sound energy harvesting. So uh, here again, we looked at the green. We want to wanted to use the green structures, but the problem is that uh, depending on the input sources of the frequencies, the focal points appear at different places, which is called chromatic aberrations. It, it, it happens in optics as well. So in order to solve this problem, we came up with, uh, we came up with this idea of uh, adding coating, la coating layers, like a chromatic coating layers, which can be topology optimized like here. So using topology optimization, we could identify the distribution of the material ABS or air. We use air. So we, if we add these two materials, as you can see from the simulation results on the right side here, when we add these coating layers, the focal points invariantly appeared regardless of the frequencies, unlike this case, unlike the conventional cases. And this is experimentally observed as well nicely. So the uh, green structures, acoustically rigid, rigid materials, aluminum uh, were used. And for coating layers, we use ABS using 3D printers, and we use the acoustic uh, wave guide to make plane wave gener to make plane waves um, that can that can be applied toward the green structures. And these these are the experimental results. So the upper top shows you the uh, the results, um, the sound the relative sound the pressure map uh, without the chromatic. Coating layers, while uh, the bottom part, bottom map shows you the uh, very um, 
achromatic behavior of the green lenses with achromatic coding layers. And I have to say that this is a featured article and this, is, this article is published this week, so you can find it now online. I'm very proud of this work. And um, I'm going to go to the next level. So the other thing we looked at with, uh, we, we wanted to using sound wave, uh, sound wave energies is omnidirectional focusing and harvesting. For omnidirectional, as like intuitively can think of, um, there's an optical black hole, like a black hole really. So electromagnetic waves come in and they are trapped at the center. And uh, there's an um, acoustic counterpart to this. And so there's an acoustic black hole observer. We adopted this idea to have the omnidirectional focusing and harvesting. So we uh, designed the structures by varying radially the refractive index. And we adopted the circular symmetry so that we can have omnidirectionality. And in harmonic analysis, you can see that at the center, the energy is focused, the sound energy is focused. And this article is published this week too. So, um, and so our, um, the design we have, uh, we fabricated using ABS uh, like before, and we we um, customly made the acoustic duct system to evaluate the sound pressure at the center of the uh, omnidirectional phonon capacitors at the center and without it too. So when we compare uh, the uh, sound pressure of the omnidirectional phonon crystals with um, um, nothing, then you can see that there's a amplified sound pressure. You, you can see the sound is amplified with uh, in a wide range of frequencies, especially at around eight 100 hertz, there's a maximum amplification occurs. Um, and the experiment, the same thing can be observed. And at the focused point, we put the, uh, um, uh, we uh, try to characterize the harvesting performance using these omnidirectional phononic crystals. So we located the PBDF, the PSOT polymer film, on the bottom of the omnidirectional phononic crystals and we could find that uh, the, there is a power enhancement up to more than seven times. And since we use the uh, piezoelectric polymer commercially available to in film, if you can use uh, a device with high performance piezoelectric motors, there's a more further room for further enhancement. And if we looked at the impedance matching between the air the and the structure, and we can further improve the energy harvesting performance using this um, omnidirectional phononic crystals as well. Th that was about the, uh, the sound energy harvesting. So I have to check the time. I guess I'm out of a little bit of time. So far, I've shown you various types of metamaterials, including phononic crystals for energy localization and gradient refractive index type to alleviate the directional property. But the other way, at the, on the other hand, we have to look at the interface between the metamaterials and the energy harvesting devices which has not been done at all so far. So metamaterials is a really um, you know, early stage of research. And then this metamaterial based energy harvesting is more early stage in the uh, research, I guess. So we looked at the interface and what we found, I, I will make a brief uh, um, summary here. So what we found is that in, um, instead of just using big piezoelectric energy harvest, like big diameter or big uh, piezoelectric um, ceramics like here, there we have to consider the me mechanical impedance uh, that we have to consider the trade-off because uh, between the voltage generation and the impedance mismatching thing, or we have to think about the voltage cancellation effect because of the wavelength size. And depending on the phononic crystal size, the unicell size or wavelength size, we can determine the sizes of the energy harvester to enhance the energy transfer at the interface. And like in vibration energy harvester, uh, high, um, I, the product of a high piezoelectric coefficient d times g is the best for um, the best performance of energy harvesting using phononic crystals as well. I, I think I have to wrap up somehow.
So, so far I've talked about the energy transfer and things here. Um, oh, so this is a summary thing. So uh, today I showed you several concepts of matter materials for energy focusing and energy harvesting. So elastic regimes, you can see the phononic crystals and gradient things for sound in here. But the current work we are working on is that the current we are uh, current uh, topic we are working on is meta surfaces because these structures are very large. In, we really need to reduce down the sizes if you want to carry uh, out uh, carry the uh, the portable meta materials or if you want to install very very easily. So what we think of is that we can use local resonant materials, uh, meta meta materials based uh, vibration structures or meta surfaces that can give us some soft wavelength scales. That's what we are working on right now. And once we develop a new meta material designs. What we have to do is that we have to integrate these meta materials with uh, into energy harvesting systems. For that, we have so many nice collaborators um, who are experts in piezoelectric energy harvester material, energy harvesting materials and devices, also circuits. Uh, I'd like to give you some of the uh, future directions about, I already mentioned the broadband operation of the energy harvesters, but uh, it applies to, it applies the same to the matter materials. We really need a broadband operation of matter materials for that. We can look at some other uh, innovative matter materials designs, or as I said, we need, really need a size reduction for that. We can use the matter surfaces or mechanical matter materials that we I can cover today. And once we look at the, um, in terms of the matter material based energy harvesting perspective, we have to think about the impedance because uh, there's an uh, interface. And then one, even if we observe too much energies uh, out of the uh, amplified energies um, through the matter materials, it cannot go to, if we cannot go through the piezoelectric devices, then we cannot obtain the electrical energy as much as possible. So we have to think about inter, we really need uh, interface studies and we really need a target application to use in matter materials devices. Um, I couldn't, I'm, I'm a little bit lame um, it, it, um, to include all of the, um, my collaborators, but these are part of them. And then we are happily working on the energy focusing and harvesting systems all together. And I'd like to wrap up with a comment with my favorite um, phrase, uh, milliwatts with mega impact. I always put this slide at the end. So energy harvesting technology is something that gives a very small power like milliwatts, but I'm, I'm, I strongly believe that it will bring really a mega impact toward in the world. So, um, and coupled when coupled with meta materials, I believe we can make a broad impact on the world and then we can contribute to the world technology. Thank you so much. And sorry for being a little bit behind five minutes later. Yes, uh, uh, we are ready for the um, uh, question and answer session. Uh, hold on. I can't see them big enough to read them here. I need to guess uh, switch to a different uh, view of uh, at the screen. Okay, well, now I can see the question and uh, let me read it for everyone. Uh, Dr. Kim, for using defect in crystals to harvest the energy, um, will it damage the materials in long term? Oh, the defects. So, the um, defects in the crystal, yes. Yeah, the feeling, um, the feeling from the term defect means we have something bad, but the Defect here is that we don't uh, introduce unit cells as user. So if you think about the whole type unit cells, we have no force, and I don't think it will damage um, the performance, the whole performance with the big because of the introduction of the defect itself. Thank you. 
And normally uh, defects uh, are unexpected and we try to typically avoid them in the real materials. How to make the device work in this uh, case of uncertainty and presence of defects? Um, so if you're a mature scientist, um, it might be, you might be familiar with the uh, eliminating defects, but this is a, I, I showed the slide which shows the, uh, the scale of the wavelength because this is the, a different, different scale of uh, structures. So what we call defect is a very like um, purposely introduced one and this is a very uh, carefully designed um, unit cells. Um, I don't know how to say that. So um, so this is not something that happens without planning. So this is an intentionally introduced uh, unit cell design. Defect is also a design. So you can think of uh, a uh, ononic crystal with a defect is a combination of two unit cells, two different unit cells. So uh, a majority of unit cells and one type of different unit cells. So this is not something different. I, I think this is a bit different um, from the defect that we think of in mature science that we want to eliminate. Hope this answers the question. We have probably time for a couple of more questions. Another question is uh, um, uh, whether the elastic energy harvester can work also at low frequencies. Oh, so in the last slide, um, I showed some the vibration level of so low frequency metamaterials. So that's a very um, low frequency elastic metamaterials, but I tried to categorize those sources. So um, it can use the vibration structures, the whole structures like this, but at low frequencies in elastic regimes, it's still the solid waves can go through and we can use them. So a lot of questions I got um, so far regarding the elastic waves, uh, wave energy harvesting utilizations. So people ask me, where are those elastic waves? So if you look, if you think about the shock waves from the bridges, so we measured actually the elastic waves, the components, the frequencies and the amplitude from the bridges mm -hmm. and the, on the roads and the buildings. You can find everywhere from the industrial side or on the, uh, on the uh, infrastructures. There are so many um, low frequencies or high and high frequency elastic wave sources that you can use them also. And elastic waves we can use at any frequencies, but the thing is we have to think about the size because it will go, the size will be larger and larger. So we have to think about some innovative ways. Thank you. And we probably have time for two more questions. Uh, for the acoustic harvester, can it be used in a cell phone or in other handheld device uh, for daily applications? Can it be made so. small I, enough yeah. and produce enough energy? Um, I have to be really honest here. So at uh, the least energy generated, I, I mean, hmm. The very uh, mechanical source that can generate the least level of power is unfortunately sound. So sound energy is real, really has a, a very low density. So uh, the, that's why we focused, but the sound is everywhere. So we want to use them. But the problem is, is up to so, uh, until, um, so, so far, what we have as a omnidirectional or chromatic things like in this big. So you don't want to carry out, you don't want to attach these big sizes of structures on top of, uh, in addition to your cell phones, because you want a smaller cell phones. So what we think of right now is that we want to use some smaller sizes of uh, um, uh, the sound focusing and harvesting. But I think we need some time to make them um, portable and then additionable to the cell phone. I don't want to carry that big one yet. So, um, but the uh, re realistic environment we can think of about the sound energy is the, uh, like a stadium or the road, expressways or those things. So once we have a wave manipulation capability, 
um, not only the wave focusing, we can think about the uh, wave manipulating or um, to attenuate those sounds or all those things. So rather than addition, addition to south ones, I'd like to think of some more realistic applications. But we, um, I think it will some take some time, but I make sure that I will make some sound focusing meta materials for your cell phones. And I don't know who asked that, but I keep that in mind. If I Thank can you. reduce down the sizes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, well, um, um, my last question actually personal would be here. To what extent using nanomaterials, two-dimensional materials, you can improve design of uh, harvesting devices and design better metamaterials? Uh, in terms of 2D materials. So, hmm. So uh, we adopted a lot of the concepts of metamaterials, the acoustic and mechanical metamaterials out of those phononi crystals uh, existing in semiconductor materials. So, and uh, a lot of the intriguing concepts came from actually graphene's recently. So there's a topology of acoustics uh, related, uh, are related, the, the, the field of topology of acoustics is related to 2D materials. And we adopt the idea uh, from the physics of 2D materials. And then now I think we are in the stage to move forward to making those 2D materials integrated into the, um, the better material system, not only just uh, mimicking some ideas out of the structures of the 2D materials. And Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Well, again, uh, we are presenting this certificate, a virtual certificate to you. Uh, and uh, you will get, of course, an electronic copy. So congratulations. Thank you very much for opening our ACS Nano Rising Star talk series. Thank you so much. And it, this is an honorable event. I'm really enjoying a lot. And thank you so much, Alice and Yuri and Paul and everybody. And thank you to the audience who's, who's staying with me tonight. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Am I coming through there? Very good. So it's my honor to introduce Professor Nanshu Liu, uh, who is an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin in both aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics, 